Aaron mentioned, our format tonight is for uh, us to have a conversation around this big question here tonight. And so we'll be doing that for a little while, and then at the end of that time, we will open it up for questions and answers from the audience and continue the conversation using that, that format. Um, I think this video might have triggered a lot of questions in your mind about what was my McAllister moment and the kinds of um, ideas and inspirations that we share together as members of that um, extended family. Um, for me personally, a lot of my McAllister moments um, came around issues of diversity and equity. My sophomore year was the year in which 30% of the entering class were students of color or poor students from Appalachia. I happened to be a resident assistant that year, and it was a challenging year because as a community, this made a big transition and one for which we were not fully prepared. But boy, did we learn a lot um, in the process. Um, but those issues for me were planted at that time, and so it's really my pleasure to serve as the facilitator for tonight's conversation on um, why inclusion isn't enough. So I'd like to start with um, a big question as a subsection of the big question. <laughs> <laughs> and that has to do with the um, what definitional notion. Uh, we use the terms diversity, equity, inclusion, um, many other variations on those. Um, and oftentimes people use them interchangeably. So I'd like to ask my um, um, colleagues in this conversation today to start by talking about your understanding of these important terms that are helping define our conversation tonight. All right. I don't know if people, okay, people can hear me. Sometimes I'm a little more soft-spoken. Um, so um, thinking about how we can define these terms, I do think that definitions can help us because oftentimes we are in conversations with one another and we talk right past each other using the same language. And so for me, I'm gonna share some definitions that come from um, the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And I offer these definitions up to kind of poke holes at them um, because I'm not in love with them, but there are some things that I do like. Okay, so diversity, it is the individual differences, example, personality, prior knowledge, and life experiences, and group social differences, example, race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, country of origin and ability, as well as the cultural, political, religious, or other affiliations, right? So that's basically everyone, right? All of us can be a part of diversity. Um, I think that a lot of times people um, interchange diversity and inclusion or make sure that they're coupled. Um, what I did like about their definition for inclusion is it's the active intentional and ongoing engagement with diversity, which comes about in the curriculum, the co-curriculum, and in communities, um, which individuals might connect in ways that increase awareness, content knowledge, cognitive sophistication, and empathetic understanding of the complex ways individuals interact with the systems and institutions. So as I mentioned, diversity um, and its definition from this website is very wide and expansive, and I think um, sometimes we lose sight of those who are underrepresented. And I think that's why um, several years ago people decided that we needed to start talking about equity and not just diversity and inclusion. Um, and so before I turn it back over to Donna to talk a little bit about the graphic behind me um, that a lot of us have experienced, I think that the, the broad definition of diversity is important. Um, as well as thinking about what it is when we, we're talking about equity as being those who've been um, historically underrepresented or underserved. Um, because I think a lot of times when we do use the word diversity, we're talking about quote unquote minorities and then people with privilege don't see themselves within that category and don't feel compelled to contribute to what needs to happen for diversity. Okay, great. Um, so, how many of you in the room have seen this graphic before? Oh, almost everybody, so we're, we don't need to explain it. Um, I personally am particularly um, tickled by the visual metaphor 
living my life as the person in purple. <laughs> Um, but it really makes us think about how, how is the world built for certain kinds of, in, in this sense, certain kinds of bodies. We navigate the world. Um, those who are, I guess, in many ways, the red shirt is kind of like the normal body. And if you're too tall, things don't work for you. And if you're too short, things don't work, work for you. And what does it mean to look at the world um, and build the kinds of world that people with all of the, all of the colored shirts can navigate, equal, um, not equally, um, navigate successfully because they, they, you, we aren't um, being confronted with very um, concrete and real structures that get in the way of us um, being successful. So if we think about from equity to e equality to equity to liberation, I want to talk about the liberation one. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about um, if we're, if, if we're thinking not just about physical structures that get in our way, but what are all the ways that we think about um, what we need in order to be successful and um, what it means for all students to be able to be successful? Is it that um, we um, include them, as Marjorie is saying? Is it that we think about equity? Or what, what would it mean to think about a liberationist um, um, framing for what, what is needed for students to, and everybody to be successful? So. I, um, there are a bunch of universities at this point that are really trying to come to terms with the impacts of their histories and to really figure out what it means to deal with those histories. So places like Brown University, the University of Virginia, Georgetown, Princeton are really thinking about what does it mean that um, the physical parts of institutions were built by the labor of people that had been held in, in enslavement. What does it mean that endowments were grown because of um, the sale of of people who had been held in, in enslavement. What does it mean now um, to think about changes within institutions to get at those kinds of histories? And it's both those kinds of financial and physical things that create institutions, but it's also in the ways that we think. It's also in our curricula. It's, also, it's in what we define as excellence. It's what we assume to be um, important knowledge. So thinking about liberation means that we need to think about what were the kinds of histories that are um, that mean that our education uh, educational systems are built on the knowledge of certain certain peoples and the subordination of others mm -hmm. and that thinking beyond equity and inclusion means empowering people who come from those histories to really have a voice in saying what those what the impacts of those histories are and what we need to do to change them mm -hmm. so I, I did want to show another graphic that kind of talks about the illusion of inclusion. And um, for those of you who might not be aware, last year at McAllister, um, we worked with a consultant by the name of Dr. Jamie Washington to take our whole campus in a diversity exercise to ground us in language and to start thinking and imagining ways that we could be a more inclusive institution, not necessarily a more equitable one, but to start thinking about inclusivity and um, he used this graphic and it was like oh this is another great way to talk about what has happened um, the circle um, to your left um, the beginning is basically what um, institutions of higher education look like way before you have your privileged people in the inner circle and you have those who've been marginalized or underrepresented in the outer circle and then through time you get to the middle circle where okay, the institution, the structure has let in some people, but they're relegated to the corners of the campus. They're not like fully integrated. We've given them access, but in terms of that intentional inclusion, it's not necessarily happening, right? Well, today, our institutions look like this last circle or the circle on your right. And the reason why it's an illusion of inclusion is, it, is because it gets at what Donna was just saying about the liberationist model, right? So what thing has not shifted with those three circles? You can speak up, it's okay. Go ahead. Just the parameters of the larger structure. Right, so the structure has remained the same throughout all of that, um, regardless of whose bodies are let in. And it's not just the structure, but the culture um, that pervades. So all of the, the legacies of dominance and subordination is still embedded within that circle. 
And I think that that's what we're dealing with today, right? We have multicolored dots in our institutions, um, but there's still something amiss because the culture is still there um, that still marginalizes some and privileges others. So would it be fair to say that the ans your answer to the question of why isn't inclusion enough, that it doesn't reflect our equity aspirations and that true diversity initiatives need to be equity initiatives? Are there parts of that simple formula that are missing? I think so, um, for me, and I would even I kind of um, lean more towards the liberation model, too, in some ways, but also recognize the constraints of even equity. Mm -hmm. And so um, doing a lot of work, um, reading a lot from the Association of American Colleges and Universities, as they're thinking about equity, they're thinking about equal access for underrepresented students and making sure that there's opportunities to close the achievement gaps. Well, we're fortunate at um, McAllister to be at a place where there's not an achievement gap between our students of color and our white students. Our students tend to, to have parity in terms of graduation rates. What we are seeing, though, is that the students from different backgrounds are having significantly different experiences during their time there, mm -hmm. and students are still feeling isolated and not having that sense of belonging. So if you look at outcomes, we might have made it, but there's still something um, not quite right. And I think that um, we, we, had, we struggle to even get to the equality piece, let alone the equity piece. Um, and so I think that's because when we see the ways in which we're trying to provide more boxes, people are like, oh, why, am I, why aren't I getting a box, right? Or people who are keepers of the institution are worried about if they give this other person a box, what will the other people say? And so then we do the inclusion thing and make sure that everybody else gets a box and then it's still not helping the dynamic out. Um, I'm not sure that I have, I think that's a good answer. I'm not sure that I have any more to add to that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> As you responded to that, I was thinking of the challenges that are inherent in helping um, the students and, and frankly many others, it's not just a student kind of thing, um, understand the, um, the, the role that, the, that power and historical privilege and, and current enacted privilege plays in really trying to get to the equity or the um, uh, transfer liberation uh, perspective. And I wondered if you could speak to some of the, the challenges that are inherent in that mission to understand the historical legacies, to understand when um, structural diversity or the proportion of certain kinds of students who are involved in their um, inclusion uh, circle, uh, and, and the many dynamics around culture and climate that affect students' experiences, the disparity of the quality of experiences that students are having. What are some of the challenges in enacting that, that mission at Mac these days? I think that I've been thinking a lot about um, from what position or what, um, where's, the, where's the question coming from and how do people that um, it's not just that we have different identities, but we're situated differently in, we have different social locations because of our identity, if that makes sense. So um, if, um, when, we, when we are doing this kind of work within what some people are now calling and identifying as primarily white institutions, um, to sort of identify the legacy of um, how everything about the institution has been shaped by who's in it, who has positions of power, who's teaching, who shapes the curriculum, who shapes um, policies, procedures, norms of the institution. Um, the challenge of inclusion is that um, it's an assimilationist model, that people who were not part of those structures are invited in as long as they can live up to the, the norms and structures that are already in place. Um, and the challenge of equity is that 
we do not yet have people from all different social locations um, in decision making places or even in positions to be able to shape what we think the solutions are. And so we are still struggling with um, structures that are built around the norms of whiteness, for example, or the norms of middle classness or the norms of um, certain kinds of physically able bodies. And that it, um, we are trying not to do inclusion or come in and you know, join us and be like us, but we don't have enough people who are um, able to engage with us in a way that shapes everything differently because we have those different perspectives um, and, that, and because we have undone the, the structures of power enough that everyone can contribute to what it means. And so then we have um, very critical voices that are often seen as being disrupted you know, for within the structures. And so um, some, there are some attempts to sometimes manage the critical voices because they are seen as disruptive mm -hmm. rather than that they bring a critical analysis for the thing, kinds of things that we need to address. Yeah. I would just add um, some of the uh, other challenges that come along with that is just like that broad definition of diversity, it's also thinking about how different people have been marginalized, different groups, different individuals, and trying to meet those needs in equitable ways and trying to figure out how you prioritize that. Mm -hmm. um, we were just talking um, briefly about some of the work that our Council on Equity and Institutional Transformation is working on. And just, it's so much. <laughs> like, it's hard to figure out where to start because who do you serve first? Or you can't do it all in, in one setting. We don't have enough capacity to do all of that. And so what do you pri prioritize? What does that look like? Um, especially if we're thinking about diversity in its broadest terms. And then, like, what do you do with the nuances that come with intersectionality? Mm -hmm. I think um, that's another thing that we're seeing is that um, people with different identities, um, intersecting identities, trying to find space where they'll be fully accepted and understood. And so then we have, we continue to have different fractures or different silos of different communi uh, communities because people are trying to find their place where they belong to. And I think to add to that, um, we're at a time where um, I think because of what's going on in the world around us, there's this heightened sense that we need to do something. We, ne um, we need to make our spaces ones that are okay for all of our students. Um, and so there's a lot of energy. There's a, an incredible amount of goodwill, but there's not um, yet a lot of capacity. And so if we are trying to do this work throughout the whole institution, um, it ends up being asking people to do more work on top of the work that they already do. And so again, how do we structure in the work in a way that makes it possible for us to do everything that needs to be done? Could you speak a little more about the role of this council as an, um, a, a site or an example of the kind of transformational change that you envision? <laughs> well, I guess I brought it up, so I'll talk a little <laughs> bit about it and then Donna can um, fill in a little bit. So it's uh, something that we're experimenting with this year um, in terms of advancing the work that we started with the consultant that we had last year as a way to think about what, where and how can our efforts for diversity, equity, inclusion live that speak to the whole institution and that are not just kept in different pockets across campus. Um, I think that people naturally um, think of my office, the Department of Multicultural Life, or um, Donna's um, area in the Institute for Global Citizenship as the go-to places, as the places where there's expertise and that will handle those things, but really trying to think about if this is an institutional commitment, how do we um, ensure that there are efforts and accountability measures to really infuse these components throughout our institution in a, a sustainable way. So it was really exciting at the end of last year when we worked with um, this consultant, Dr. Jamie Washington, for a whole year. He did a series of workshops for faculty, staff, and meetings with students, um, bringing everybody together, sometimes working with different constituencies separately. And at the very end, his last session with everybody together was, what would, what would you like to see this work look like in a year, in three years, and longer? Mm -hmm. And I think at almost, every, there were table conversations, and I think at almost every single table, 
um, people said we need accountability and we need to make sure that everyone knows this is, this is their work. It's not just the work of, of certain offices. And so the council was a place to move that forward. Um, and so we're trying to figure out exactly structurally what that means. Um, how do we provide the um, opportunity to develop the skills and knowledge that's mm -hmm. necessary? How do we think about how the work is structured? How is it built into everybody's work? Um, and what would it really mean to move forward as an entire institution? I think we're both concerned. Um, we know that um, but we're both fairly new. I've been at McAllister for two and a half years. Marjorie's been here for one and a half years. Mm -hmm. And so people have been very generous in talking to us about you know, helping us to understand the institution, its cultures. And one of the things that I think we've both done is we've gotten um, old reports by commissions, councils, committees, and it keeps growing. <laughs> and so we want to make sure we're not just producing something else that goes on to that pile. It sounds like you've designed that, that council to potentially get at some of the underlying structural change and processes that can serve to perpetuate um, some of the um, historical legacies that perhaps haven't been articulated or acknowledged uh, over time. We hope so, and we also like to acknowledge that this might be a structure, but there are other structures that have been doing the work for a long time and that we want to honor the work that they're doing and try to create some to create better coherence between what is going on too mm -hmm. and so that things aren't just operating behind the scenes that are operating very well um, that no one knows about it or that things are being duplicated because we don't have that clear communication between different entities on campus. So Don, I want to pick up on your point about the um, kind of the, the current context of the work and you know, context covers multi-layers from the context of McAllister, context of Twin Cities, of Minnesota, of the nation, et cetera. Um, so in the Michigan, as Michiganders in the room will recognize, uh, with the, the voting in of Prop 2, really caused a lot of questioning about ways that a diversity and equity agenda could legally be pursued. At, Mich at the University of Michigan, but also in um, other, other state, state contexts. And so with a goal of changing structural diversity on campus and a goal of making higher education accessible to a broader range of the citizens of the state had previously been done by having programs targeted towards certain social identity groups. Women in STEM majors was one, and um, uh, underrepresented minorities, another key aspect. Well, that all had to be rethought. Uh, so the context in which this um, work is done matters greatly. And so I wonder if you could speak to the ways uh, the current context shapes the way you approach and do the work at McAllister. Sure. So, uh, so I can start with um, the affirmative action question. Like, how do we think about um, policies that are intended to create opportunities for um, access for people who have not had access before. And Michigan has had um, its struggles. Um, before I was at McAllister, I was in California, so we had Prop 209 and specific policies within the UC system. And it's very interesting to be in Minnesota where the landscape, that landscape is a little different. But I'm, I'm really interested in the way that um, sort of legal struggles um, Legal, legal ways of thinking end up shaping the way we do other work. So with affirmative action, um, there's a specific policy in the 60s that was intended to create opportunities for people to have access to jobs, education, et cetera, um, who hadn't had access before. Um, and then immediately there's legal challenges. So it becomes a legal question. And um, in higher education, um, from the Bakke case to the two cases in Michigan, Grutter and Gratz, there's a way that the legal structure, uh, struggle is around this kind of individual, individualized notion of access. So um, in an individual rights system, you are, we, are, we are supposed to figure out what are, what are the individual rights at stake. And um, things like race are not individual matters. Like a race, a, a person's race is not just an individual characteristic, but it's the way that a group has been constructed in history 
um, and how those, the constructions of those groups has legitimized practices of subordination and exclusion. So um, as soon as Baki makes this refer reverse discrimination claim and, say, and says, I was excluded from med school because of my race, the court looks at an individual rights framework. Um, and then to, and in that case, um, UC viol violated his individual rights, and, and, but the court said there still is some question of um, diversity matters, and so affirmative action can be used in a, in a much more limited way if it doesn't violate individual rights. And then that comes up again in 2003 here in Michigan. And so it's interesting, as, as the court has said that affirmative action is okay, it has changed the nature of what that is. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's no longer to address historical inequity, or the, the ongoing effects of historical inequities or exclusions. The affirmative action is legitimate in higher education if it's part of an educational mission that um, is based on um, having diverse voices to enrich the educational experience. And so um, it ends up turning to a diversity question that Marjorie was talking about before, that we just have diverse voices and those diverse voices can be diverse in a number of ways. Race is just one of those. And it's no, we don't have the tools for thinking about what, it, um, how do we create programs and approaches to admissions that are specifically geared towards creating access for those who have historically been excluded? And so the legal landscape shapes the way that we think about what the work is, and it's not just it, then it's not just about um, admissions or specific programs, but we start talking about the value of diversity in terms of diverse voices, and that we don't ha haven't had as rich conversations about how do we address the histories of exclusion mm -hmm. as they affect every part of the institution. And so that's the struggle. We don't want to violate the law because there are consequences to that, but just because there's a legal norm, that doesn't have to shape the way we talk about everything else. Mm -hmm. I would just add that um, to that context, I think that our students feel that. And so um, a narrative that we currently hear at McAllister, um, you'll hear from not just domestic students of color, but also international students saying that they feel that their presence on campus is there to um, enrich the education of privileged white um, students that gives them the, the ability to speak and say, I came from this diverse place and I had this friend in college and um, some of them believe that some of those aspects are performative. And, and it's interesting that we hear that from both international and U.S. students of color, that it really is, like I'm supposed to embody this diversity for somebody else's experience. So how do you um, embrace this broader notion of, of diversity? And certainly there's histories of exclusion for a lot of social identities. Um, how do you embrace that mission and at the same time acknowledge what's often seen as uh, um, something that white people in particular have a great difficulty having dialogue about, <laughs> that is race, and how race becomes like an elephant in the room sometime around discussions where any difference is the kind of difference we need to be talking about. Um, when I was there, we used to joke about the keen differences between Lutherans and Methodists and <laughs> Presbyterians because those were great religious differences that, that were, were palpable uh, ones. Um, so you know, that it's a tension there, it seems. So I wonder if you could talk about how you're dealing with that. I think it's um, just trying to make space for a number of different conversations with a number of different groups and sometimes it has to be with um, similar identity folks. Um, so either in, um, I, our, in our identity collective mm -hmm. where um, there's affinity based off of identity and also trying to create spaces where people from different backgrounds can also interact with one another. Um, I think in our society it's this either or, mm -hmm. but we really have to figure out a way if we really do believe in liberation thinking about how we make space for everyone to be able to come into the conversation at different points mm -hmm. to get what they need and to be enriched in that way. Mm -hmm. I can follow up just a minute. So does that mean that um, a, a, a 
to engage a white student around issues of race might not be a good starting point, that you might engage around other kinds of differences and then expand it to race later on? I, I think the way that we set up our um, conversations is we have folks identify what their identities are mm -hmm. and let them select where they feel comfortable entering in, recognize that they have a multitude of identities. Mm -hmm. So it could be race, it could be gender, it could be um, religious or spiritual orientation, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, and from there we can start the conversation to really explore, okay, and what does that mean in the society? And I think that that's for our students, but also for our staff and our faculty more recently mm -hmm. with the work we did last year. And I see it as a matter of education. We're in an educational institution, and education is both in um, the co-curriculum and the curriculum. So um, education includes um, thinking about our own identities and experiences and getting to know each other and hearing our stories. And it's something that's in the, cur in the curriculum. So how do we think about, uh, how do we learn about um, the ways that certain differences are structured by power? So getting back to our image here, like I don't really feel like my life um, my, my life is structured based on the oppression of short people, although it affects my life all the time. Um, and that we know that you know, the taller candidate usually wins elections and all of that, mm -hmm. but it's not a structure of oppression that's built into everything. And race is something that is. And so students can have these dialogues, um, understanding each other's experiences, and they can take American Studies courses where they learn about how race is structured in power and how it has shaped the, the country and how it shapes international relationships. And through that process, of education, um, we bring in people. It, it's not just like my race affects me this way, but I understand that in relationship to other people's experiences and the way that their race is structured in society. Sure. And the intersectional dynamics. Right. Yes. Well, we hope we have piqued your interest with a variety of um, perspectives and aspects of this broader topic. So at this point, we can open it up for you to have an opportunity to ask your questions as well. Um, please do speak into the mic so that it picks up on the, on the tape. So I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I, I hope I can express, I, I'm just, I'll start with one. Um, you, you indicated, we, we saw early on the, the three circles um, and the, the third one still indicated Indicated there were some issues. What would what would a what would that look like if it if it was the way we want it to be? I mean, th I think we saw the the inclusion was still within the the circle of. I'm not even sure how to explain it. The, the, the how we've gotten to this point. How would it look? How would it look if we? It's a good circle. Yeah. Thank you. That's a that's a good way to put it. Thank you. Because you didn't show that. Is, is, there, is there something out there? I think that that's a great question. We haven't figured it out, and I think that that's something that we need to do collectively. I think um, in social justice circles or um, doing the diversity work that we do, we're really good at um, critiquing what exists, and we haven't um, had enough time in collectively imagining what could be. Mm -hmm. And so that, that last circle, is really thinking about how we get to this part where there isn't that structure that's a barrier for everyone. We just don't know it yet, right? And so, um, yeah, if I, if I had the answer to that, I'd be a very, the world would be a very different place, perhaps. Um, but it is a, a struggle, and um, there are different ways in which um, institutions of higher education continue to reward us for maintaining that circle um, in different ways. And that it'll allow a little bit of room, a little bit of wiggle room to change certain things. Um, and so we, we can't take um, those things for granted either. But it, it, we really do need to spend a little bit more time um, imagining what could be. I think at McAllister specifically, I think that we are creating spaces to have that conversation. Um, I know this year we've had a few sessions around um, liberation. We're trying to um, ask people what they want when we're in our sessions and to think about what could be. We're listening to students. Um, the administration that we have is listening and paying attention and trying to figure out 
how we move in different directions. And I think um, the fact that we have this council this year is evidence of us trying to, to move in that way. And for me, sometimes I think students are the ones who um, give us the vision of something that when we're in a position, we have a certain job within the institution and we're tasked with doing certain kinds of things that we get so, um, even though we are both in positions where we can be really creative and it's, um, it's really great to be able to build things and build relationships and collaborations for thinking differently, sometimes it's the students who have these experiences of engaging in different programs, going to different classes, doing interdisciplinary work that's much broader than when we get really specialized. And uh, sometimes in their moments, um, and sometimes it's in protest where they say, this is not working for us. We are, we are capable of building different kinds of relationships, putting together different kinds of analysis and critique, um, connecting it with how we can be fully ourselves in a way that's more healthy than this highly competitive environment. And sometimes they show us the way. And I don't think it's that they have the model, like what, it would, what the circle, the non-circle would look like. But I think that they are putting things together that we can also follow in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just curious, you had mentioned that there's a number of institutions that are working to um, break down those like historical, um, basically what brought them to that point. Um, I'm wondering, as you approach the work in McAllister, if there are other institutions that you see as sort of um, examples that are uh, doing well with this work and anything in particular that you're like, that's pretty good what uh, they do, if that makes sense. That's a really good question. I, I think, I don't think any institution has it. Um, I think there are a lot of good programs at different places that take on a piece of this. So maybe I'll back up and Pat had asked about the current context. The other context that we didn't talk about so much is that, um, there's a new book out called Diversity, Inc. It's, I think it's just out within the last few weeks or month. And um, the author talks about the billions of dollars that are going into diversity programs, workshops, um, trainings, et cetera, et cetera. And not much has changed, given all of that. And so diversity work in not just higher education, but businesses. Um, so the, there's a great deal of interest in doing this kind of work, and yet it's being done in a way that's not changing things. And so um, there's a concern that a lot of this is more about um, marketing. So um, if we think about what is the reason that we do this kind of work? And in an educational institution, so that everybody there can do well. It's, None of us wants an institution where some students don't do as well just because of who they are, or some faculty don't do as well just because of who they are. Um, and yet, at the same time, um, it's also in circumstances where um, there, there are limitations on how far some aspects of the institution will go. And so what is it that so what, what, are the, what drives this? So in the affirmative action case, like why, why should we have diversity? The people who were fighting for affirmative action in, in education were um, not only people within education, but businesses in the military, right? Mm -hmm. So the business argument for diversity is that we need people who can um, create markets in new places with new communities mm -hmm. or um, who can work with different populations from a market perspective. In the military, we need people who are able to interact, you know, work together for a, you know, a single cause. Um, and that, that's diversity work. Um, and so when you ask, like, who's doing it well, it depends on what model it is, right? And so I think there are places, like, um, there's an institution, I'm not gonna name it, but is, um, has rolled out workshops for other institutions 
and they're making a ton of money off of it, right? And so um, we could do the workshops, we can learn how to do particular kinds of programs, but it's also within a neoliberal model of um, making money off of diversity work rather than coming from the, um, um, the groundwork of those who are most directly affected, shaping the direction of it. And that's the kind of work that I don't see as much of, like how do we build on the critique rather than how do we build on this more business kind of model within a liberal arts setting. Thank you for being here. In light of the 2020 census, my question revolves around, in the context of affirmative action and being a legal question, the census, I, I, I posit, was leveraged in a particular way as to say that there could be no quota, right? That there was this sense that you had in many ways to diversify, but it couldn't be based in a notion of what type of population you were trying to serve. What are your thoughts about uh, the limitations, and I see a lot of limitations there. Um, one being that if I wanted representation, uh, say in Minnesota, I would want it to look like Minnesota if I was just to think about skin deep. And in the balance of a place like McAllister, I wonder how you run up against this notion of what the institution should look like while it is diversifying. I think that that's a difficult question, and it's do you want McAllister to look like Minnesota, <laughs> or do you want it to look like something bigger than that? Because it has a very different context. I also think about what is it, I'm, I'm always questioning, what does multiculturalism mean at McAllister, right? What does diversity mean? Is it um, good enough to say that we have about 30% of our student, our um, students um, coming from, um, representing domestic diversity, when you have people who are isolated because there's not a critical mass of them coming from a similar community, right? And so what do we do with those dynamics? Is it enough to say, well, we have one of these and one of those mm -hmm. and one person from over there when they're still struggling to have someone who understands their life, ex their life experience? And so um, really thinking about how we, we push and not just about the quota piece, but to really think about what that looks like. I know that um, I've witnessed a few conversations about um, specifically around um, undocumented students, um, <laughs> most recently refugee students, mm -hmm. um, African American students that have been, whose families have been here for more than three and four generations, so who had, had, who had ancestors who were slaves. At McAllister, we tend to get a lot of first and second generation African American students, um, and then also um, with our Native American populations. And so that's what I've been hearing a lot around where's the critical mass of people from these backgrounds. Um, I think that that used to be a part of the conversation um, maybe 10 years ago um, when I was doing admissions work. Like we were, we were trying to skirt around what we could do with affirmative action and it was like, well you can't have quotas so we just have to start saying critical mass and then you'd ask somebody, well what does that mean? And we're like, I don't know, we just <laughs> need a critical mass, right? And I don't really hear critical mass that much, but I, I definitely hear our students who feel like they're the only or one of two or one of three mm -hmm. saying that they're, they don't have that community. And I think that that's important. I do think that it's important to, to have that mm -hmm. representation. And um, as we're thinking about the liberation, I think that there has to be diversity there, right? There has to be structural representational diversity there too, right? It just, we just can't just fixate on that one aspect of it. It has to be broader than that. So I'm a humanist, I don't think in terms of numbers. Um, <laughs> but if you, I, I really like this, con like getting back to the concept of critical mass, because that's um, not something that's easily defined, but it also gets us away from, it, it, 
I think it would enable us to look at race in a way that's more complicated than just saying here are the racial categories and we're trying to get so many numbers from those categories. Those are, those are complicated categories because of intersectionality or because of um, um, length of time in the country, immigration status as opposed to long histories. And if we think about critical mass, it's not enough just to say, well, we got a couple of people who are from countries in Africa and a couple of African Americans. We have to really think about what is the rich um, mix of students that we can really um, um, understand the nature of, of the histories and the, and the current context because we have enough people from, from all of these different um, communities that have been affected differently. And I think um, also related to this is that um, maybe it's not about numbers, but it, it's what, what is our relationship to the communities within the Twin Cities and, and Minnesota mm -hmm. so that we be become the kind of place that um, is not just open to, but wants people from the different communities in Minnesota and that has the relationships and so students from those communities want to attend and that that enriches um, um, who we are able to bring into the community for the, for the um, experience. Um, now I sound like I'm talking about en enriching the educational environment. Really to have um, not just people who create richer experiences for e others, but who are able to then um, participate in the education in a way that they, who they are and where they come from in their communities can also shape who we are in ways that, in ways that are fulfilling to them. It's a big mission, isn't it? <laughs> that in the process of making opportunity accessible and changing the lives of the individuals on campus in the context of the community, in the context of Minnesota, in the context of these larger world problems. Um, it's a small but mighty college. And, um, I thank you for leaving us on, on that note.